So thank you everyone for joining tonight's Youth Advisory Board um, We Hope Coalition meeting on February 10th, 2022, um, 7 p.m. This is a virtual meeting. And um, we'll start by just making sure that I have everyone in attendance. Okay. And we have an extra helper over here, so I'll try that at a time. <laughs> um, so I just want to make sure that um, everybody that I see on my screen, um, and I'm just going to actually ask you just to introduce yourself because we do have a new person here shadowing. Um, Connor Keen is here. He's a, a senior at Southern Connecticut, and he is in interested in the juvenile justice, criminal justice. Um, and with youth. So um, he's going to shadow a little bit of our juvenile review board process and um, our youth advisory board and some other stuff with Michelle Waterman. Um, so I will start. So I'm Erica Texera, Assistant Director of Social Youth and Senior Services for the town of Wethersfield. Um, can I have, um, can I have you go next? Mommy. Oh. Mommy. I'm going to put we missed who you said to jump to. Pam, you want to go next? Sure, I didn't hear you. Yes, I'm Pam Harrison. I'm the school psychologist at the high school. I also am on the uh, JRB for the town. Kathy, can I have you go next? Sure. Kathy Bagley, I'm the director of Parks and Recreation and Social Youth Services for the town of Wethersfield. Patrick, you want to go? Sure. I'm Patrick Talman, Youth Development Manager and also the Nature Center Director. Okay. Allison, do you want to go next? Hi, I'm Allison. I am the Prevention Coordinator for the Social and Youth Services Department. Michelle, do you want to go next? Hi, I'm Michelle. I'm the um, case manager for CRB and JRB but it's social youth services. Maria, would you like to go next? Sure, I'm Maria Alfonso and I'm a longtime resident. Obviously, I've always cared about children and youth come from a long line of teachers. I am not one, but I certainly respect the commitment that folks in the education field have for both children and youth, which are our future, not to sound like a story that it's true. Um, Colleen, do you want to go next? Sure. I'm Colleen Keene. I'm a community <laughs> member. I have a daycare here now. Barbara B, do you want to go next? Sure. Welcome, Connor. I'm Barbara Bellis. I'm mom of Jim and Joe, who are seniors at Wethersfield High. I'm secretary to the principal at Wethersfield High, longtime resident and community volunteer. Uh, Barbara Rui, do you want to go next? I've been on the Youth Service Advisory Board for practically my entire life. I'm a lawyer who does a lot of child protection work. And if you're interested in watching some juvenile court trials virtually, give me a call. Right. That was for that was for Tom. <laughs> Good connection there. Uh, Dave, do you want to go next? Sure. I'm a longtime uh, Weathersfield resident also, and I am a prosecutor in the Hartford Court. Um, Sarah, would you like to go next? Sure. I'm Sarah Briggs, and I'm the teen librarian at the Weathersfield Library. Um, Alyssa, would you like to go next? Hi everyone, my name is Alyssa Gilbert. I work on evaluation of the drug-free communities grant with Bonnie. Thank you, and Bonnie. Hi, hey, I'm Bonnie Smith. I obviously work with Alyssa. Um, together we do evaluation of the drug-free communities grant and we also um, do work on surveys about youth behavioral health. Thank you. And um, Mary, um, we're just going around and introducing ourselves. We have someone new here tonight. So if you don't mind introducing yourself. Hi, Mary Pelletier. I'm on the Weathersfield Town Council. 
and the town council liaison to uh, the youth advisory board. Thank you. Connor, would you just like to give a little introduction of yourself as well? Yes, I'm Connor. I am a senior at Southern. Um, I'm in the criminology program there and excited to be here. Welcome. Welcome. Awesome. Welcome. So I think I'm going to do things a little, switch up a little of the agenda tonight, um, just going a little out of order. If I could have Patrick give an update on the youth services, I'm going to start with that to kind of get that out of the way and kind of run through some of the stuff quick because Allison and Alyssa and Bonnie have some real good information to share. So I'm going to have Patrick go next. Uh, the after school programs are going very well right now. I've been over there every day for it. The basic baking class is full. They've actually taken one over the wait list. Not the wait list, so they're a little over full. They're already registering for next session. I'm getting a lot of feedback for next session looking like it's going to fill too. Minecraft Monday is all filled. So you can only take 15 because of the licensing on the computers. So she got 15 there. And the uh, I went to the robotics class today. They have 13 kids participating in that. And Leslie Poulos is doing something a little bit different every day with the uh, with the media center on Monday, it's Minecraft Monday, but there's a creative writing class that was today. And like this one project they're doing, it's really cool. I got a picture of, it. I don't know if you can see it, but they're making something with Rubik's cubes. Like they they got like several hundred Rubik's cubes and they're trying to do like a picture and it's, it's Martin Luther King. I don't know if you can see it on my phone at all. Probably not. There you go. Oh. That's all like oh, yeah. Wait, Rubik's they just nine. did a ton of Rubik's cubes and like placed them to be Martin Luther King. Yep. That's so cool. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's why I took that's a picture. Awesome. I had to say, like, that's amazing. That's so cool. So wow. yeah, there's a lot of neat stuff going on and tutoring is going well. So everything's going really well over there. Friday night hangouts maxed out again. We, we had to cancel last week because of the weather, but we're going great guns again tomorrow night. So everything is going really well. And I guess we're gonna talk about the scholarship stuff later on, Erica. So should I bring it up now? Um, yeah, we can bring it up now just because I want to um, save the bulk of the time because we have okay. some data and some good stuff to go through. I don't know if you all had a chance to look at the uh, scholarship application, but it's pretty much ready to go. I just wanted to make sure everybody kind of had a glance over it and if they had any comments or questions. Because if we're, if we're going to go, I may have to change the dates because the due date was like a month from today. I don't know if we got to push it back a little bit, give us a little more time. And, but other than that, I mean, it's ready to go, but I can probably have it out early next week if we're ready for it this is maria it looks it looks great to me i think mm -hmm. lifetime is one word though when you have it with a space throughout might have been a spell check thing too well spell check picks up i think grammar error but not spaces between words i'm not sure it picks that up but in a couple I'll, of places I'll go back and it again. well yeah it's right it's ready to go i can have it sent out over to the high school we can get it out. I mean, most of the time we only get four or five applicants anyway, so. Is everyone with us continuing with our Yabbit scholarship for um, a senior who's done exemplary volunteer in the community over their um, you know, middle school, high school career? Absolutely. You talked about yes. pushing, I wouldn't push it most out definitely. too. Um, the deadlines are like March 15th, so I yeah. know Kids are basically trying to wrap up their um, scholarships usually around that time. So I wouldn't push it out too far. And if they're going to do it, they're going to do it. All right. And like they let it sit in their backpack or sit somewhere too long. It's not going to happen. All right. Well, I'll, I'll get it over to the high school. And then if when once you fix the those typos, if yep. you can send a copy, I'll post it. Okay. Okay. And do you want do you want some over at the guidance office, Pam? Absolutely. Okay. So do you want me to make copies for you, or do you want me to just email it over to you electronic? You can email electronically. We'll take care of it. Okay. Thanks so much, Patrick, for all your hard work. I really appreciate it. Because then I'll, I'll just get it. Up. If you want it all electronically, I can just get it out tomorrow. Because mm -hmm. it's only going to the high school. So. Perfect. Um, anything else, Patrick? I don't want to cut you short. And I know we're doing the volunteer thing. Are we going to do anything with that this year at all? 
Yeah, that was kind of, that was the other part of it that we kind of went a little back and forth with, um, just because I know a lot of the students didn't have time to, um, or didn't have the opportunity to do a lot of volunteering because of COVID. Pam, I believe was, wasn't it you, Pam, who sent something that another group is doing about? Yeah, the National Honor Society. Um, they kind of, let me pull it up. Um, they kind of got creative in how they um, are doing it. So that would be here. So she said, um, here it is. Um, some examples of what kids have done or doing. Um, there's a soup fundraiser that's a National Honor Society project crocheting stuffed animals from my sister's place, a pet supply drive and various other supply drives, food, hygiene products, et cetera. A YouTube channel with them recording themselves reading books that are played at lunches at elementary schools since kids had to sit alone last year. Uh, video tennis lessons and golf lessons for girls so families could keep up with lessons or drills when in-person lessons couldn't take place. Bracelet packages for healthcare workers at Harvard Hospital, park cleanup, worry dolls for uh, LMFT, Mother's Day cards for Executive Square, homemade socks and blankets for Prudence Crandall Center, and the school-wide Among Us game, which was an NHS project. So all sorts of like more um, project-based things rather than um, individuals spending time somewhere. And we would still look to capture, um, would we still look to capture the time that people spent volunteering and then try to hold an event? Is that something we're thinking that we would do? My opinion is I have to wrap my head around what kind of time I'm putting in the we stuff because there's a lot on our plate. Sure. It's not a typical spring. Yeah. I, I, you know, I mean, what do we have ahead of us this spring to towards our objectives? A little well, bit my, more. My concern is it's the high school kids can do stuff, but it's when we do the younger ones, they don't have the same opportunities for volunteering. So, I mean, like Pam explained that the high school kids got some alternatives for them, but the rest of the kids that we normally serve don't. True. True. Well, I think we can keep the Yabbit scholarship and then, I mean, I think we can brainstorm on what we think are revamp our youth uh, volunteer recognition event and kind of maybe look to do something maybe in the, the fall and make it look different. What about doing some sort of event um, over the summer that would be a volunteer opportunity? I, I, I raise this because I'm, I'm on my university's alumni association mm -hmm. and they're talking about having us sort of sponsor a volunteer event in our community. So I might be able to, you know, honcho something like that over the summer. Um, you know, we could do park cleanup or, you know, we could think about it. Oh, that's a good idea. Yeah. So kind of in the action of volunteering and doing a little celebration after the, the work right. type of thing. And it would be outside. I know First Church has a huge group from all different uh, churches coming from all over the nation to Weathersfield this year over the summer. And they're looking for up to 400 volunteers. Right now they have 200 volunteers, a little over. Um, and they're looking to um, work on people's homes in Weathersfield, hmm. um, doing minor repairs outside and um, building you know, ramps for, for um, handicap ramps, doing painting, cleanup of yards. And it's all going through an organization that is a, a bunch of different churches church groups in the, in, in throughout the nation. Um, and they actually, Weathersfield was chosen to do a week long project here and they're gonna be housed like at the high school um, for a week. So it's a really cool thing, but they, um, the pastor there, uh, Todd, Pastor Todd um, said that we can, you know, send people their way if they are interested in volunteering and see how they could be of help. So there's another That's option. Incredible. Yeah. How yeah. have they been advertising for volunteers, I haven't heard about that. There, I don't think they, they, I mean, they've, they've done it through like this big church organization that's across the nation with all different denominations. But oh. um, when he spoke, cause he was at, 
he was working with our department to kind of look at what the needs are for some of the residents we work with that don't have funds to clean up their yards or build ramps and all that stuff. So we're going to connect them with households. Um, I nice. just started brainstorming about getting local youth and their parents and other people involved here since, you know, if they have the need and they're trying to fill those spots, that would really be great. So um, I can ask him to send something and we can kind of blast it, you know, if that's the, their goal. But it's uh, First Church has kind of taken the lead for this Weatherfield project. Right. Yeah. So I will definitely try to get something. So I know they have a flyer, I believe, but I'll ask him on the other end of like, if people want to volunteer. So yeah, I mean, I think these are all great ideas. I like the whole doing something and then celebrating after. So to be continued as a possible suggestion and goal yeah. for the summer. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Wonderful. All right. Um, I wanted to just give like a quick um, update, a time for uh, Sarah, if she would like to give an update on the library and then any, you know, staff or parents um, on the meeting tonight, if they want to give any youth updates as well. So Sarah, take it away. Okay, so um, kind of the same as last month, we have our um, same hours, we have our study rooms open for two or groups of two to four people at this point. Um, we still don't have our meeting rooms open yet. Um, we have put more seating back into the library so people can come sit a couple at a table, um, but we're still for the most part doing social distancing and we still have the mask mandate. Uh, we are doing in person programs and those numbers are picking up we're limiting them to 12 currently, just so we can use a space big enough for everybody to spread out but. Um, it's good to see young people back in the library and um, things are going pretty well so. Looking forward to continuing in person and hopefully um, expanding once the numbers go a little bit down for COVID. Wonderful, thank you. Any parents or school staff that want to share any um, updates since the last time we met? I'm with Eric not on the next night because I know his son has a game, but um, you know I think we as a lot of the parents have seen with the parent square updates from our principal, we have seen an increase in um, physical altercations at the high school, um, which um, stinks <laughs> to put it nicely. Um, but you know, I, I'm hopeful that some of the measures that we're putting into place can help reduce that. You know, we're doing a lot of education with the students kind of around the actions that they're doing that kind of fuel the fire, be it, you know, recording the fights, sharing the recordings of the fights, um, kind of keeping that message going. And so, you know, us as staff are really working to quelch that. Um, and we instituted the anonymous alert so that students have a safe way to feel that they can kind of alert us when something might be brewing so that you know, the people who need to be places can be there and intervene when they need. Thank you, Pam. It's a good point to bring up. Yeah, definitely something that I think a lot of us are paying attention to at the high school. Anybody else like to share anything? Um, I set up the Port of Ayarta uh, fundraiser. It's not until May 9th. May 9th, um, perfect. Yes, Monday night, it's from three o'clock on, it's the typical um, dine in or dine out, 20% goes, will go back to us. So he was very nice. So once it gets closer, I will send out a flyer for you guys to um, share and I'll be sharing it on Weathersfield pages and of course our page. Thank right. you, that's wonderful. Maybe we can have a, an evening all together outside Absolutely. With, uh, food and well, margaritas. <laughs> That'll be great. So late. They'll have the patio and everything open, hopefully. So yeah, that's cool. Awesome. Yeah. Appreciate all of that, Colleen. Um, anybody else? Do you Michelle? think you want me to do a fundraiser? Do you think you want me to do a fundraiser at a uh, wooden tap? Or is it too early? Is it kind of a state of flux right now? 
it's kind of up to the group. I mean, I know now that Puerto Vallarta, I think is it's a good timing that it's in May. So maybe more people can enjoy it. Maybe we think about it after Puerto Vallarta, just try to try to maybe do something in the fall, early fall. I think that's great. Yeah. Let's get okay. us through this and then we'll take our summer break and then maybe think about fall while it's still warm. Because yeah. they have that outside tent, we can maybe do something. That's perfect. Yeah, you're right. Good. Yeah, so we'll have, oh, that's good. Okay, stuff to look forward to. Um, I, I know Michelle. Go ahead. I was going to point out that the legislature's in session, and I think there's going to be a fair amount of discussion about juvenile justice. Um, there's conversations about opening up the juvenile mm -hmm. training center in Middletown, which I think is a bright idea. But they're also talking about sending more stuff to the JRBs, and at least people are raising the, the concern that there's no money. What they're doing is they want us to do stuff for free. And um, we need to pay attention to that. Unfunded mandates. Yes. Story of your life, Barbara. <laughs> yes. It's in our department. <laughs> um, thank you. Yes, that is very important. Uh, Michelle, does, is there anything that you wanted to share, um, update us on quickly? Um, no, still doing the case management. I agree. A PAM is an influx and stuff going on, going on at the high school with the stuff that we've been seeing via email and at the middle school. So I hopefully the meeting that we have coming up will be productive and we can get some resolutions to some of the things that's happening. Yeah, the, yeah, trying to meet with the high school staff and other uh, staff um, to kind of come up with some ideas and maybe some programming and all that good stuff. Yeah, hopefully that will be very productive. Um, Why do we think there's an increase in the physical altercations because of COVID and everybody's just tired of being locked up or? It could be a combination of things. It could be the anxiety. I mean, there's subtle bullying happening as well. Hmm. Well, there's definitely an uptick of, of mental health issues among children and youth. Mm -hmm. um, there have been the articles in the Hartford Current about the log, log jam at CCMC. And through my caseload in the Rockville Juvenile Court, I'm certainly seeing kids cycle through the emergency room, being shipped home and then cycling back because they're just not ready. They need beds. So it's a mess. Yeah. I agree, mm -hmm. Barbara. It's an influx at Mount Sinai as well on our kid unit. And on our regular unit at Johnson, we start at age 18, same thing. And there's nowhere for them to go. Oh. And we're going to hear some data tonight of uh, Weathersfield, so that will kind of give us some information as well. So stay tuned very soon. Um, Mary, did you want to share anything from um, town council then? Um, I think probably the most relevant thing to this group is um, the council discussed um, whether the town would permit cannabis dispensaries to um, mm. you know, for recreational cannabis to uh, be permitted in town. And um, it seems, so right now the uh, Planning and Zoning uh, Commission has put a moratorium on them um, and uh, that expires around June, I think, maybe May or June. But um, it's, you know, from our discussion, so we didn't vote on it, but I think we're leaning against it. I would say right now it's, um, it, we are probably looking not to permit them um, because frankly, the tax money that the town would receive, there's so many restrictions on it that, um, and, and the cost from the police department and social services would increase around the facility. So it doesn't even seem like it's worth it for the tax money because the revenue, there's so many restrictions on where we could spend the money. And all, and secondly, um, you know, it's you know, Erica spoke at that the meeting, and um, the police chief did as well. Kind of um, indicated the the mixed messaging it would send to the kids in town too, where you know you you want to tell them on one hand, uh, you know, oh you shouldn't do this, but on the other hand, we're opening this great place. Here's a ribbon cutting, and you know, and it's it's just some mixed messaging, and with all the restrictions on the tax revenue it doesn't even seem worth it from a financial perspective either. So um, having said that, it's not, you know, we haven't, you know, banned them as of yet, but I think that's the way the council is leaning, but 
you know, it, it's probably kind of close. So it, it could still go the other way, but for now that's sort of, that's the latest. <laughs> I appreciate you sharing that. And actually, um, at that same meeting, Mary um, made a great plug for our Youth Advisory Board and our We Hope Coalition, and she even held up some awesome swag for everyone to see. So um, we got a great plug in there. So thank you, Mary, for, for doing that for us. Sure. Um, awesome. And then, uh, Kathy, I just didn't know if you had anything you wanted to share. Good? Okay. Um, perfect. Um, all right, so um, I think we can kind of shift it right over to you, Allison, if you want. Are we going with the data stuff first with Alyssa and Bonnie? Is that kind of um, I'm going to go through some stuff and then they're going to take over. It's going to be a switcheroo. So right. would you mind making me the host? I will. Or allow for screen sharing? Sure, yeah. Because I know that Bonnie and Alyssa will probably need to screen share as well. So if it's just like enabled for everyone, it'll work well. Yes. So you want me to sh have you guys all co hosts? Or, yes, or you can just enable um, screen sharing. Um, okay, so I. Just made you a co-host. Okay, so I'll just start cruising through. And I'll work on the other ones. <laughs> I'm, I'm just gonna do it for you. No, oh, okay, perfect. And I do just wanna mention before Allison gets started that um, we will hear some data from our youth needs assessment survey that we conducted in late November, beginning of December. Through seven, from seventh through tw uh, 12th grade. We did report that data to the superintendent and to the Board of Education um, a couple weeks ago, maybe not even uh, a week ago or so, um, two weeks maybe. But um, we were able to talk to the town manager and we are on gonna be on the agenda for uh, March 7th for our town council meeting to present the data as well to the town council and obviously residents of the town. So please stay tuned. And if you're available, please either um, come on down if you would like or watch on TV, just so you guys, you guys will get the data uh, pretty much tonight, but just to, to see kind of um, sharing it with town council and questions they might have and anything from the community. So I just wanted to put that in on everyone's radar. Awesome guys. And I'll stop talking, I promise. No, you're wonderful, you're wonderful. So how is everyone? doing <laughs> pretty good for thursday oh yeah absolutely so i'm going to peachy keen peachy keen all right everyone can see what we got going on here mm -hmm. i would just mm -hmm. like you to appreciate this first picture right in the center that little boy just kills me every time <laughs> he's so stinking cute so i added it just for uh to boost morale i guess you could say <clears throat> All right, so I want to do a quick little icebreaker. How many people have the chance to watch the video that I sent out in our, my last email? We got a few hands. Awesome. Connor, I'm sorry that you were not involved in this fun little icebreaker, but it'll be great to listen to. And maybe I'll shoot you an email with it because it's a great video. So I'm going to do a quick little synopsis of it so we can get through the icebreaker real fast. Um, so what this video is, this is someone talking about Drew Dudley talking about leadership and kind of reframing the idea of leadership. He uses a experience he had when he was working um, at a university and he was giving out lollipops to people. He interacted with this girl um, who ended up being incredibly moved by him just giving her a lollipop and like the narrative kind of goes forward and this girl reaches out to him years later and expresses how like that conversation completely changed her mind on continuing on in school and like um, also like was incredibly influential. So the whole theme behind it is that leadership moments come in 
all different areas, aspects. A leader wears so many different hats and it can be something so small that can sincerely impact someone's life for the rest for the rest of their life. So I thought it was a great way to kind of lead in to tonight um, and let you all know that you all wear your own like leadership hats. And I wanted to give anyone the platform to kind of talk about a lollipop moment they had where someone's small act of kindness um, was very influential. So to like share that story, we have about five minutes to go through that. So for those of you who watch the video, does anyone have anything to share? Hmm. I can give a lollipop moment. <laughs> um, so I was a freshman in college and I had not been very into like, um, I was very a cardio based athlete. So I did a lot of running and I, I played the cross. So I was very oriented with that style of exercise. And I went into a gym and someone was like, Oh my gosh, like, do you want to like learn how to like bench press? And that small moment of like that conversation um, completely changed my life. Like now I compete competitively in weightlifting and I have been, I like, I'm, I'm a personal trainer and like lifting is like a huge part of my life. I would say that like, it's a lifestyle for me and it's something that I use as a coping skill and have fallen in love with. And if that person didn't like offer to teach me how to bench press when I was a freshman in college and was like a string bean, then I wouldn't be where I am today. And like, wow. I, I have a competition this Saturday and it's just like that small blip in my story by that one person being really kind to me completely changed like my interests and like where I spend a lot of my time. So that's my little lollipop moment. Pretty cool, good luck. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Anyone else have any little tidbits they wanna share or we can move on to the next thing. All right. Well, you're all leaders and you're all cats. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I, as always, I like to go over our mission and vision. So we are, our mission is to be a community coalition dedicated to engaging and mobilizing youth, parents, and community partners to reduce youth alcohol and drug use and to create a safe and healthy community. Our vision is to create a safe, healthy, and thriving community free of underage drinking and drug use. I wanted to quickly go over our SMART goals that I did send out to you all. Um, however, there wasn't too, too much response to it. Thank you uh, for those who did have time to work through the different, um, the different worksheets. Um, I'm actually thinking about tabling this discussion until our next meeting. Um, just, I'm gonna go over it again briefly. I'll send it back out to you all and we can spend some time with those um, next meeting. I think that this is a great platform to just get ideas on paper. So the goal of this honestly is just, what do you, want to see within your subcommittee. And we have two overarching objectives as a coalition. The first is to reduce youth substance use. And then the second is to build our coalition capacity. So within our two subcommittees, how can we do both of those things? And with that seed that I just planted and I will plant it again via email, don't you worry. Um, we're going to try and just get a little more ideas on paper. You can, it does not need to be anything super specific. You don't need to follow the exact mapping of the SMART goals, but I want you to start getting ideas down on paper because we are going to have a conversation um, when we break into our subcommittees. That won't be today, it will be next time about how we can implement these goals and the things that we want to see with the work of our drug-free communities grant and what we have to meet with the grant. So like, where can we interweave your ideas and your thoughts within the framework that we already have established? So I'm gonna just open one actually because I'm sharing this specific screen. Please hold, I'm going to have to change my screen sharing. All right. 
So this is just the youth one. And um, you can see here, it's just, thank you, Barbara and Pam. I appreciate you. Very brief, Pam, agree with Barbara, like that. <laughs> um, just, and you can also now go off of what other people have said to kind of get an idea and help to get the juice flowing, but just brief, what goals do you have in mind for the youth programming? Be specific. So where do we want this to be accomplished? Who's going to be involved? How do we measure those? So what ways can we evaluate and make sure that we're meeting those goals or those ideas? With the framework that we do already have in place, it will also guide this conversation. But I really just want to see what you guys are expecting and give you that voice to talk about what you're interested in. And then achievable, relevant, and time-bound. So time-bound is just when the deadline would be realistic. So I will be sending that out in an email. So don't even worry about it for right now. We're gonna go back to this. All right, is everyone seeing my PowerPoint? Cool, are we all following along with everything I just gave out? Awesome. If I'm going too fast, please stop me. I do tend to talk fast when I'm going through this kind of stuff. All right, and so my you understand what I was saying? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Four, <laughs> June and May, where we're trying to go. Synonyms. Anyways, um, we want to learn and understand the strategic framework, which is what we are going to be going through today during this. We want to review and discuss the survey data, which will be happening today. Thank you, Alyssa and Bonnie. And then we will also be touching on it briefly again in our March meeting. We're going to work on a community mapping activity and understanding the why here, what's going on in Weathersfield, what resources we have, community culture. And then we're gonna be reviewing our strategic plan and how we can build onto that within our subcommittees. So how we can use that as a way to um, meet our goals and then also meet the grant goals. Also, um, I want to briefly touch on, depending on what's, okay, before Bonnie and Alyssa go, I just want to say I had a really good meeting with the kids today. We, Pam was there. Thanks, Pam. Um, we did get a, some information from the youth about the survey. They said that after talking with their peers, they found that a lot of people didn't believe that it was going to be anonymous. Um, and so a lot of them didn't answer honestly. And they said that was like a common theme. So for, um, I just wanted to put that on your radar, Bonnie and Alyssa, we, we can chat about that also. Um, Wait, I'm going to jump in. I'm going to jump in. Yes. Oh. So of course is what I'm going to say. Absolutely. Yep. But in our world of survey data, that is a universal assumption of all surveys that there's an under report. Absolutely. So, um, I just want to note that as much as we tell them it's anonymous and it really truly is anonymous. Um, my own kids took the survey. Yeah. Um, well, I was just going to say that. Don't too. believe us. The, yeah. So the, what they did, so they did suggest something that they think that their peers would be like, oh, okay. Um, and like respond to it is like showing past year's data and how it's presented so like how it's like aggregated and like put into specific groups so that they know what it's going to look like when we see it. They said that like seeing that would make them feel more at peace and that, and that like that would provide um, more reassurance about that. I just wanted to share that little tidbit, even though obviously I know things are underreported. No, that's a great idea. I don't know how you would do it like in congruence with the implementation of a survey, but that's a I mean, the last we could pull it we could pull it in in like the video oh that's true that's great and idea. like as we're going through it make it like a little like when we say it's totally anonymous like look here this is how we view it kind of thing yeah no that's a great idea um so I just always like everyone to know though before we review data that um it's a consistent under report within the same community and then within other communities who take the tool and other similar tools Sorry, Bonnie, I wasn't trying to make it seem like it wasn't. Oh, no, that's okay. I get that question all the time. Um, and then also they spoke to um, 
this is just to put on everyone's radar, this doesn't have to do with data, is that their advisory um, times in the morning are a waste of time. They straight up said, waste of time, everyone just sits on their phone, nothing is productive. Um, and uh, Pam, am I voicing that correctly? Yeah, and I think, um, you know, I'm sure Barb Ellis hears it as well. It's just kind of this, yep, we know it. <laughs> I think what has to happen is the adults in the building have to be better educated and be more into it for the kids to be more into it. Absolutely. I'm going to write that down as a place where we as a coalition can intervene. Okay, so I'm going to hand this over to Bonnie and Alyssa. I'm going to stop sharing. How do I stop sharing? Oh, there we go. <laughs> Bonnie has started screen sharing, it says. <laughs> Bonnie, you're muted. Sorry. Um, can you all see what, if I'm not in presentation mode? Okay, I find in Zoom presentation mode is really hard to present within. So you all know that this survey occurred in uh, late November and early December 2021 for grades seven through 12. Uh, we included some questions around COVID impact, uh, COVID-19 impact on substance use and mental health. Tonight, we are very focused though on substance use and mental health, not COVID related. Uh, we do also have some data on sexual behaviors of high school students for the purpose of our time frame tonight. We don't have that here, but we have um, that will be presented to town council actually. And there's a full report that I'm sure you can access that can be shared with you. Uh, we have really great response rate of 88% overall. Uh, the last time we did the survey, it was 91%. So right there where we'd like to see it. This is just uh, tables that demonstrate the identified race and ethnicities of the student participants, as well as their gender, not their biological sex. We do have data on their biological sex as well. Uh, but we wanted to point out, actually, Mr. Emmett honed right in on this, that the last time we surveyed, about 2.75% of students identified as non-binary, transgender, I'm not sure right now. And this time 6% did. So that's a major increase. I'm gonna I'll also note in the full report, which I really hope you all take an opportunity to glance through, um, we do analysis by biological sex and race and ethnicity. We also did a supplementary analysis this time on gender identity and how all those things are statistically significantly different um, in terms of behavioral risk factors by group. So anywhere we see a statistical difference in the full report, we note it. So if we see that um, females are drinking more than males, you'll see that in the report as example, and it goes all the way through. So starting with emotional health, looking at past year anxiety, um, you can see that most students report some of the time, which about 56.3% of all report some of the time. And then looking at a combination of almost always and always, 27% of youth report that. And last time we surveyed, it was 20%. So definitely has gone up pretty, um, I'm not going to use the word significantly, but that's what wants to come out because it's not tested that way statistically, but a lot, 20 to 27% is a lot. Looking at sources of stress, this is looking very similar than the last time we surveyed with academics being at the top for both middle and high school. These are the grades. And then post high school plans for good reason uh, stands out for those students in grades nine through 12 next as well as schedule. At the bottom of these rankings, you see social media as not as much of a source of stress and financial security, although a little bit higher 
for both in the high school level. Perhaps those students at the high school level are more aware of financial situations in their families. Looking at emotional health indicators, a lot of really um, important information in this slide, but I'm gonna kind of hone in here on sad or hopeless. And then those sad or hopeless two weeks in a row, which is more of like we call sort of a, it's not a diagnostic, but it's more close with the definition of a clinical depression episode. So on 2019, we had 7.8% of seventh grade youth and 8.4% of ninth grade youth reporting suicide. And for this survey process, we have 10% uh, considering suicide, sorry, in the past year and 9.3 at the high school level. So those, that suicidal ideation has gone up a bit. And I wanted to note that 9.5% here overall is 165 youth who had considered suicide in the past year. Mm. It's a lot of kids when you think about the number. Looking at sort of assets, um, comfort seeking help. The majority of students or at the highest level here at 65.7% said they felt comfortable seeking help from a parent or guardian. Followed by friends comes next, especially at that high school level in the dark green. Most students feel comfortable seeking help from friends. Looking at school staff, we see a um, less than we might expect here with about 21% indicating yes overall. And then 40% of students have another trusted adult besides a parent or guardian in their life that they trust or can seek help from. In terms of outside of the school uh, and community, more generalized, students feel or report feeling the most comfortable seeking help from a counselor or a therapist or a doctor for mental health. Um, less so on internet counseling or um, the faith community and the internet overall as a source of information, the high school students definitely stand out as feeling like that's a place they feel comfortable getting help. This is about having a trusted adult. So most students over 90% in all grade levels felt they had an adult they could share with, um, feel safe in their community. And overall, 84.5% feel safe at school. So Alyssa's gonna talk about substance use now, and then we're gonna sort of highlight how these pieces, mental health and substance use might be linked to other um, risk factors that we looked at in the survey. Okay, so looking at substance use and perceptions, we will start with lifetime use. So what this means when I say lifetime use is the percentage of youth who have ever used a substance at any point in their life. Um, and so what you see here is kind of what you would expect as far as alcohol stands out, Vaping is next, followed by marijuana. Um, this is the similar shape to the way it looked the last time this survey was done. You know, alcohol continues to be the most common. Um, generally, these numbers are down a little bit, but we'll look at that a little closer when we look at past month use on the next slide. So again, alcohol stands out as number one, although overall in that seventh through 12th grade level, it's 5.19%. That's down from 6.7 the last time this was done. Number two is marijuana, and that's at 3.68%, which is down from 5.1% last time. So that's quite notable. Um, and then vaping, nicotine is 3.6%. Last time it was 3.5%. So it's about the same. Um, interestingly, gambling ticked up a little bit at the high school level, and I'm noting that only because of increased access to gambling and online gambling, and I think that that's going to be something that we're keeping an eye on going forward. Next, we'll look at past month use by grade. So as you would kind of expect, we see that stepwise increase as youth tend to get older, the substance use tends to increase. Um, very little use of things in the seventh and eighth grade, particularly you'll see zeros for cigarettes, vape products, tobacco. Um, they actually, the middle school has quite low use overall, which is to be expected. 
continuing on. So now we're looking at age of first use or age of initiation. And what this means is how old were you when the, the first time you used a substance, if you've used the substance before. So interestingly, generally, all of these ages have increased, meaning youth are starting to use when they're a little bit older, which is a good thing. We want to delay that initiation as much as possible. Um, so age has increased for every single one of these, except alcohol is about the same as it was last time, and vaping is also about the same. Um, and then the other thing I wanted to note was prescription drugs increased. It used to be 12.5, now it's 13.5. So that's a, a full year delay. That's pretty notable. So continuing on, we're looking at perception of clear family rules around substance use. And we know that youth who believe that there are strong family rules kind of use that to shape their decisions. So we want these numbers to all be nice and high. These all look pretty similar, but I think you'll notice that alcohol is a little bit lower than the others. Um, only 76.6% .6 of youth are reporting having clear family rules around alcohol. Um, and every all the other numbers are in the 80s, uh, mostly the mid 80s, in fact. Next, we're looking at parental disapproval. So this means how wrong do your parents or guardians feel it would be for you to do the following. And again, similarly, youth who believe that their parents disapprove are influenced by things like that. Um, and so we want these to be as high as possible. Again, you'll see alcohol is the lowest of all of these substances, although not by a lot. They're all pretty high. Um, and then next, the only one lower than that is gambling um, and marijuana is also relatively low. We can continue. Um, looking at peer disapproval, same thing. How wrong do your friends feel it would be? So this is the percent of youth reporting that their friends feel it's moderately or greatly wrong. And we want these to be high. We know that they'll be lower than their parents. Um, and so interestingly, it's not quite the same. Um, vaping here is the lowest. And that's followed by marijuana. And then one thing that's interesting to me here is you'll see gambling kind of falls in the middle of the pack, um, perhaps some more disapproval for gambling than maybe you'd expect, or even more than nicotine, for example, vaping nicotine. Now we're going to look at the per. Oh, okay, good. I lost my spot. This is a tricky one to digest. Um, this is the perception of peer use in the past month. So how much do you think your peers are, how many of your peers are using? Um, and it's, it's a lot to take in, but the high level finding here is that high school students perceive that vape products are the most used among their peers and that's followed by alcohol and marijuana. And then the middle school it's vaping and then alcohol. But generally kids see that um, very few is pretty close to correct. Now we're looking at perception of risk. So another one we want to be nice and high, and it's how wrong do you think people risk harming themselves when they do the following substances? Um, and, you know, marijuana stands out as kind of low. Only 60% of the high school youth are reporting that to be risky. However, interestingly, 74% report gambling to be risky. So high school youth believe gambling is riskier than using marijuana. Um, that was surprising for me. I haven't seen that pattern or haven't noticed that pattern before. This is ease of access among youth who have used substances. And so we want these to be high again. We want them to think it, want them to feel that it's harder, sort of hard to access these substances. Um, all are perceived as slightly harder to access than the last time we asked this question. Alcohol continues to be the lowest. So only about 53% of high school youth are reporting that's hard to get alcohol. Um, compared to things like prescription drugs, which are much higher. So this is where substances are acquired. Where are youth getting these substances? And so you'll see that um, vaping, alcohol, and marijuana are most acquired from friends. Tobacco and prescription drugs are most acquired from home without parents' permission. And then I want to note here an alcohol you'll see after friends and peers, you'll see home with parents' permission as the next highest, and then home without the parents' permission. Now we're looking at where substances are used the most often. So vaping, alcohol, and marijuana are most used with friends at my home or my friend's home, and followed by at a party. 
non-medical use of prescription drugs is the only one that is most commonly used at home alone. So when we're thinking about where youth are using substances and we're wanting to know, are they using it at school? Um, generally, use at school has declined, less use in school overall. However, vaping persists at the high school level in particular at that 5%. And this does include um, school events like sports games and things, not just during you know, school time. Looking at driving under the influence, overall there's less driving under the influence than the last time we surveyed. However, driving under the influence of marijuana is about twice as high, sometimes more, um, compared to alcohol. So that stands out. We have a very long list in the report of risk factors that are associated with lifetime use of any substance. And this is an abbreviated list, and I'm still going to abbreviate it further when I read it to you because it's a lot. But so some high level findings. Um, among the middle school and high school youth who have ever used any substance, they are more likely to have thoughts of self-harm and have acted on them. They are more likely to have considered suicide. And they're more likely to feel less comfortable seeking support from a parent or guardian or school staff. Among high school only, high school youth who have used any substance in their lifetime are more likely to report having been bullied, report having anxiety that makes their lives difficult have felt sad or hopeless and sad or hopeless two weeks or more in a row. Uh, and they're also more likely to have sex under the influence of drugs or alcohol and have experienced more violence, discrimination and worried about food. Um, I encourage you at this time to consider looking at the full report because we do have a full module about, uh, there's a more complete list. And I also think that the sexual behaviors module is really important as is a little toxic stress blurb that we looked at in the first time in this community. But continuing on for substance use. So this is the past month use trend data. So you can see 2016 rates, 2019 rates, 2021, and then the percent change from 2019 to 2021. Generally, they're all down. Um, particularly what jumps out to me, marijuana is down. It's a 30% change from 7.6% to 5.3%. And I think that that's just surprising given the climate. Um, I also want to note that E-cigarettes uh, using nicotine in particular has gone up a little bit. And then again, gambling has gone up a bit, but those numbers are quite small, but just something to keep an eye on. Next, we'll look at this visualized. So if you're a visual person, maybe this is more helpful for you than a table, it is for me. Um, so again, you're seeing these decreases in the substances, alcohol, cigarettes, marijuana. And then I just wanna note here that the survey changed. So in 2016, we used to only ask about e-cigarettes and then for the 2019 and going forward, we separate e-cigarettes and vaping nicotine from e-cigarettes and vaping flavored liquids, just to FYI. And then finally, we'll end on lifetime use of other substances. These are the less commonly used, generally more illicit substances. Um, but I think that we like to keep an eye on them because some of them are quite harmful, evil, even at a single use. Um, CBD is here not because it's illicit like the others, but just for context, it's part of the conversation. Um, what stands out to me here is inhalants. It is down um, from last time, but it's higher than most of the others. All these numbers that are like 0.2%, 0.3%, this usually represents about two kids, just so you know. Um, that's all I've got on substance use. If anyone has any questions, I think we would love to hear them. Mm. I wanted to make a comment too about our overall reduction in substance use rates. For anyone who's surveying in this time coming out of the pandemic, we know that the 2021 school year in particular, I think less so moving into 2022, thankfully, or not, depending on how you look at it. In terms of data, we will always have a note next to these data. We will always say that the pandemic may have impacted the conditions with which we see some change in behavior. Um, we do have a question in the survey about COVID-19's changes impact on substance use and anxiety. Most students reported no change around substance use. 
Um, but a lot of students said they use less and some students said they use more and the same can be said around their access to substances in that time. Anyway, I don't wanna interrupt for questions, but I wanted to clarify that piece. Um, I just have like a really dumb question. <laughs> like I feel so out of it, honestly. How are they gambling? Is this like an online thing? Um, do they play poker? Like, I don't, what does this not, look like? That's not a dumb question, Sarah. I, and in this survey, there's a long list of what gambling activities could include. And that might be scratch off tickets, which we know are often gifts, actually. Mm -hmm. um, it could be playing a game of dice with your friends for um, something of value, whether it's money or an item. Um, Trying to think of what else. Anya, can, I speak, can I speak to this really quick? Yeah. Um, so Connecticut has recently made it legal. Um, DraftKings, <clears throat> if you're over the age of 18, it's an app where you can go on your phone and um, like honestly bet on literally anything, like any sporting events, like you name it. Anecdote, anecdote, why am I am struggling today with my vocabulary? Anecdotally, um, I have spoken with some kids outside of like Weathersfield, but um, a large handful of them said that it's very easy to just make a new email and lie about your age because there's no like verification process. So it is very easy for kids to be able to sports bet now. And like also there's fantasy football where kids do it with their parents, that kind of thing. So it's very, um, very large territory. And share it. One of the reasons we track it and have tracked it for some time is, is the association between stimulating that part of the adolescent brain. Um, it's the same brain stimulation you would get from substance use, but of course it's acquired without a substance is acquired with a behavior. Okay. And that's the concerning thing right? It's one piece of the pie. Okay. I mean, kids do get themselves in trouble um, becoming uh, addicted to gambling, whether it's because they use parents' credit cards and then their parents are in a rough spot or something happens with their peers and there's some sort of, I'm going to use the word shakedown, um, <laughs> because they're not paying up their bet with their peers. Um, and, and Allison's spot on with this expansion of online gaming. We, we're not really sure what that's going to look like in terms of data and social consequences. All right. Well, thank you. Hi, this is Maria. I'm glad the sub you're looking at gambling because gambling easily spills over into something else because the high you get from gambling is not going to be any different than any other high. <laughs> um, and the online betting, if my husband who is much older can bet literally from his sofa while he's having a sip of coffee or soda or whatever. It only takes one under 18 person to know a friend who's 18 who could do it for them. Forget creating you know, verification of your age. You, if you know anyone who's old enough who can legally do it, all you do is give them the money and they do it for you. And the high is still the same. Um, the question, this is more like a question is, your data, does it break it down between boy, men, young men and young women or boys and girls? We don't present the data that way here, Maria, but I do know, and I have the report open. I don't have it open for sharing, but um, there are statistical differences amongst um, males and females, I believe. And I can probably get to that very quickly. Um, Males definitely report higher gambling rates than females. I don't know the significance off the top of my head, but it's definitely higher in males by quite a bit. Okay. Yep, yep. I'm looking in there, but Alyssa got it. We know there's a statistical significant difference between males and females at the high school level for um, gambling and males do it more makes me wonder though if females just don't want to report it i'm not saying true or not yeah i don't know maria i think in all my years in focus group works males it definitely comes out there too okay
All right, if nobody else has any questions, we can start working through some of the other materials that I have for us this evening. Um, I'm going to try and get us out of here by 8.30. So we got some content to cover. <laughs> All righty. Um, so a quick intro to the intro. Um, I exist in this coalition, we hope exists because as you all know, we were awarded the Drug-Free Communities Grant. Um, within that, it is looking for us to work on reducing the substance use in our youth and building coalition capacity. To do those two things, um, we have to work within a framework. So this framework was given, um, was created by SAMHSA and it is called the Strategic Prevention Framework. And this is a quick introductory video so that you guys kind of have a stepping stone to understand um, the logistics and the background to the work that uh, I do and Erica does and Bonnie and what we work on to make it so that we can put programs in place and kind of um, what we'll be working through to get our subcommittees working on our different plans for the year. So I'm gonna share this. What does the SPIF look like in our community? In assessment, we collect and Also, someone's gonna have to tell me if you guys can hear it. What does the SPIF look like in our community? In yeah. assessment, we collect and analyze data. We use student surveys, police and school records, and other sources like data from the Juvenile Review Board. We use the data to determine what the most significant patterns are in our community and what problems these patterns cause. For example, the consumption of substances and the consequences associated with that consumption. We also look at how easy or hard it would be to change the issues we've identified. We always need to be working on building the capacity of our coalition. We can never have too many community members interested in helping complete our work. Sometimes we need a pair of hands to help us with our activities, and other times we need specific skills, knowledge, or positions, like community leaders, in order to be successful. Creating a plan of action for our coalition is an important step, and we need to involve you in our planning, because you have the expert knowledge of the community. You live and work here. You know which activities will or won't work, and we want to choose activities that you're interested in and that will be successful in affecting the change we're looking for. And, of course, one or two staff people can't do all of the work of the coalition. We need to work together to make our community a better place for both ourselves and our kids to live and grow up in. Implementation requires all of us to pitch in. And finally, evaluation is key to our efforts to make our community a better place to live. We all have busy lives, and no one wants to spend their time involved in activities that aren't working. Sometimes the best ideas don't work out as we had hoped, and sometimes ideas that we thought wouldn't work too well can make a big difference. Our evaluation will help us to sort this out so we can accomplish the goals we've established together. At the center of the SPIF is sustainability and cultural competence. Please hold. All right. So that was a quick introduction. I'm going to dig a little bit deeper on it. Um, if you have questions, please feel free to stop me or just chime in. Um, I know that this might be new to some of you, so... I will definitely take my time in the next 15 minutes. <laughs> so the strategic prevention framework, this is an outcome-based framework that's completely built on our end goals of reducing youth substance use and building coalition cap capacity. What it does is it determines patterns of use and the consequences. And then also it is focused on um, specifically reducing the use. And they use three strategies to map out the framework. So population level change. So that's looking at the community as a whole. So how we can implement change across the entire community, how we can implement change and prevention over the lifespan. So not just our target age group of 11 to 18. We want to make sure that we are providing prevention to parents, um, younger 
youth, grade school children, really across all age range. And then also it's a data-driven approach. We want to make sure that what we're doing works and we want to make sure that we are implementing programs that are known to be effective. So data is crucial when we are working through the framework. So the five steps of the SPF. We have assessment, which is the first, capacity building, planning, implementation, and evaluation. And then you also have sustainability and cultural competence um, within all of the steps that you will be going through. We're all following so far? All right, so I'm gonna go into the five steps just a little more in detail to kind of guide us with an understanding of what we've done so far and what we're looking to do in the future within each steps. So assessment. The purpose of this step is to really understand the local prevention needs based on a review of the data that we've gathered through a variety of sources. We're looking to do focus groups, which will allow for a deeper assessment. The data helps us to identify and prioritize the substance misuse problems that we have here in Wethersfield and really clarify the impact of these um, problems on youth, parents, community partners. So when we conduct this assessment, so um, we will also be doing a community mapping, which will be a further assessment that will be happening next week. We're going to be able to learn like the nature of the substance use problem within the community and the risk behaviors and harmful behaviors that are also present. Another step within uh, the assessment is we are trying to assess the risk and protective factors. So what resources do we have? What are protective factors that we could instill in our youth? A protective factor is like um, having family support and a good group of peers being involved in school activities. So it's that kind of um, support that helps a youth not use substances. All right, so capacity, our next one. So this is looking at the local resources that we can mobilize and get the community ready to address our substances. So that's alcohol, marijuana, and vaping. In step one, when we're doing the assessment, we're looking at all of our available resources that we have. And then in step two, we're ensuring that those resources are ready to be utilized. So we want to make sure that the community is ready to buy into our prevention efforts and take stock of all those resources that we need to produce a positive change. So we need both human and structural resources to establish this um, prevention system that we're putting in place. So that means reaching out to um, say the Chamber of Commerce, um, using our different sectors. So all of our different representatives on this coalition from different parts of the community coming together so that we can develop and strengthen our efforts and raise community awareness. So our next piece is planning. And this is something that I have tried really hard to get you all involved with and um, join in along the way, which is definitely where the SMART goals comes into play. So planning is very strategic. It increases the effectiveness of our efforts and it ensures that all of, um, all of us coalition members and stakeholders are implementing the most appropriate programs for our community and making sure that they are evidence-based. We want to involve a very wide, diverse range of stakeholders and make sure that it's data-driven so that it's comprehensive. We really want to prioritize those risk and protective factors that we um, assessed in the first step. And then we also want to select interventions focused on those priority risk and protective factors. And then there's also something called the logic model, which you guys have not had to work through, but the logic model is a breakdown of our data within Weathersfield and kind of defining um, steps of where we should focus our enter, our focus our resources and our efforts. So that is used to then continue planning. So I did share our 12 month action plan. I do wanna note that at our next, meeting, we will be talking more about the SMART goals and how that ties into the action plan. 
Um, I know I'm throwing a lot at you right now, so please feel free to stop me and make any comments or ask me any questions. I'm really trying to get through this so you guys can get off at a reasonable time. Our next step is implementation. So this is the strategic plan, the community prevention plan that's put into action um, by implementing the evidence-based programs and practices that will work at a community level. We need to make sure that um, we deliver these programs and practices across the community, that we retain our core goals of reducing youth substance use and building coalition capacity. And then we also have to make sure that we support and monitor the different resources and stakeholders that are involved in our plan. And now our final is evaluation, which we are very fortunate to have Bonnie and Alyssa, which help a lot with the evaluation of our data. Um, so the evaluation step is we wanna conduct the process of evaluation. So that can be also within how we're doing with the coalition and how coalition members are seeing um, the way that I'm running or the other leadership roles within the coalition, how we are doing. So we can evaluate on that front. Um, also, uh, conduct outcome evaluations, so looking at different measures through programs that we put into place. And then we also want to make sure that we're recommending improvements and making sure that we're continually um, change or not continually changing, but continually tr like tracking um, how things are going and making the necessary changes so that we are constantly working towards something that's making an actual impact. And then also we want to make sure that we share and report our um, evaluation results, which I think is very important so that everyone, all the stakeholders involved, know that what we're doing is working and that it's worth their time. So that's a quick five steps. Um, I do want to speak to two more important topics because these are um, two very overarching pieces of the strategic prevention framework that you are going to see in all steps and want to think about in all steps. So the first is sustainability. Um, obviously, this is a five-year grant. And then if we can reapply, it can become a 10-year grant. The goal is that we can put programs into place and build coalition capacity to where when this grant funding ends, we can still keep this coalition alive and the work and the mission and the vision that it holds true to um, doesn't just disappear when this grant does end. So we want long-term sustainability and we really want to focus on building lasting leadership within the community and making sure that we have um, strong management and involvement from different stakeholders like policymakers, um, the public, and then also make sure that we can have representation from all our different sectors and have that be long-term and not just right now. So um, wonderful example is Mary from the town council and then also Barbara from the high school, Pam from the high school, all very important um, community sectors that will help make sure that we keep this coalition and it's very important work sustainable. And the final quick slide that I'm going to jump through, which is also incredibly important, is cultural competence. So we all are come from very different backgrounds, have different perspectives, have grown up in um, different environments. And it is very important for everyone to acknowledge those differences and understand that those are predominant in shaping our behaviors, our values, and how we interact with the world. So it's very important that um, as coalition members and as a coalition as a whole, that we are going through this process and always being sure that we are having a empathetic and understanding mindset. It does state here on the slide that it's not limited to ethnicity, but also includes age, gender, disability, sexual identity, and other variables. Um, and I think that bringing all of those differences together, we can really do a lot of great work and um, really create a diverse group of people and meet the needs of the Weathersfield community. So quick summary. 
SPF is a five-step out, five step outcome-based prevention framework that we use to reach our goals and objectives as a coalition. Our goals, I'm gonna say them one more time and probably say them a million times in the meetings to come, to reduce use substance use and to build coalition capacity. So all of the work that we are going to be doing with the SPF, with the SMART goals, with our action plan is to focus on those two key priorities, reduce use substance use, build coalition capacity. Cultural competence is an ongoing process for each member of our coalition and our community. And we want to make sure that we build a coalition program that is sustainable. Our next meeting is going to be March 3rd. We'll be taking a deeper dive into the data. Um, we're gonna be going over some of the key points again, and then we're gonna be working on a plan together for the next 12 months. So that is what I got for you all. Any questions? I really cruised through that. I tried to make this as quick and understandable as, po uh, as possible. And if you do have any questions, please feel free to email me. If you have any right now, I'm more than willing to answer them. Sorry, I cruised through that. <laughs> I just, Allison, I just wanted to say a quick thank you because I know this isn't the most interesting stuff. I mean, it might be to, you know, you and data people, um, but um, it's also very helpful to keep us all on track and keep us focused as we venture into what our coalition is going to look like. Yes, thank you, Allison. I know you put a lot of hard work into this. Will you be able to share everything from tonight? Um, out to the group. I know that you do a great recap just that we can continue doing that because I think that's helpful to in order to process this and digest it on our own terms after the meeting. Yeah, I can send out. Um, I can't send out this specific PowerPoint. I mean, I can try and edit it, but this PowerPoint is like an ongoing one for the next meeting as well because there is similar content that goes into it. So I'll write out a brief um, overview and also send the video that I have up there just to make sure that I'm giving you guys all the resources that you need. Great. And we can also send out the, um, all the data from the, the survey so people can really dig through it. Also guys, our website's live. So I'm going to send that link via email and it's beautiful and wonderful. And I'm so excited that this baby is finally in like to fruition and it's alive and ready and it's great. <laughs> Also, if anyone's ever used Google Analytics, it's super cool just for data people. It's really great. <laughs> so does anyone have any questions or are we all set to wrap up? Um, Allison, one, just one quick question. I went to the website, but also the, it looked like the survey results were up there. Is that correct? Um, I did share a, the info brief. Oh, okay, thanks. So it's a very succinct, um, Piece of, uh, I didn't even know it was up there. Hold on. I knew I shared it, but I didn't know it was. Where did you, where did you see that? Oh, gosh. Um, and oh. I, it was one of the pages of, yeah, it's not important tonight. I just thought if people wanted to see not only the website, but also some of the data that was there already. Awesome. Um, I didn't know that that was up there, but... Oh yeah, oh yeah, it is, that's great. Sorry, um, yeah, that's great, thank you. I'm gonna send a link in the chat really fast so that if anyone wants to look at it right now, you can. But anything else, can I answer any more questions? Is there no chat option, is that not a thing? So oh, when we're on these meetings, there's not, right, Kathy, because of the protection they had to put on because they didn't want anyone writing anything that's on like a recorded. Um, oh, okay. Weathersfieldhope.com if anyone's mm -hmm. feeling like taking a peek. Okay. I'm all set with my stuff. You're going to send it in an email too. So everyone will have it too. Great. All right. Well, thank you for all that. And I'm sure everyone- thank you take their time and go through it um, when they uh, are able to dig a little more deep, dig a little deeper into it. So we have another meeting on March 3rd, which is a Thursday. Um, and that we'll have our March 7th meeting with town council to present the data to the public. Um, so stay tuned. So I think everyone's probably a little exhausted. So we could definitely adjourn the meeting. Um, we didn't formally have a quorum. So I'll just call it.
to um, adjourn at 8.31 tonight. Does that work for everybody? Yep. Yes. Awesome. Okay. Yep. Thanks Perfect. so much, everyone. For your Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone, for all the work. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good night. Good night. See everyone soon. Good night.